So let's look into the topic of solar panels. I'm excited to share some information with you here. I'm going to organize information in four different topics. But before we do, I want to clarify a few terms, a few uh, terminology that we might come across as we're running through these four different topics. So to start off with, almost everybody, including myself, uh, almost always uses the wrong terminology for describing solar panels, because these units are actually not called solar panels, but solar modules. And another term, which is also used interchangeably with solar modules, is PV modules, or photovoltaic modules. Now, I don't care too much about whichever word you're using, but I just want to make sure that you know what the proper word is, and probably throughout the content, I will continue to refer to these units as solar panels. There are two more terms that I want to point out. The first one is solar cells or solar cell. So a solar cell is the building block of a solar module. So they are these uh, square or rectangular pieces, blue or dark, and they form the building block, so the core element of a solar module. And the last term is the word semiconductor, which is a type of material which conducts electricity, but only in certain situations. And the semiconductor material is the kind of material that is used to make the solar cell. So I'll teach you the fundamentals of solar panels in four different steps. In the first step, we'll look at the core operating principle of solar panels. So how do they work? How do they turn sun power into electricity, which is referred to as the photovoltaic effect? We'll then look at the different materials that you could use in order to build a solar panel. So which kind of materials are commonly used in order to use the photovoltaic effect to produce electricity. Then once we understand this, we look at how we can take the solar cells once they are made and combine them into different ways in order to form a solar module or a solar panel. And we'll look at how solar panels are wired and how they, they connect to each other. So the kind of connections that you can expect with solar panels. So let's start by looking at the photovoltaic effect. So a solar cell, so the building block of a solar module, is made out of a material um, described as a semiconductor. So as the word suggests, a semiconductor conducts electricity, but not so well. So under certain conditions it doesn't conduct, and other conditions it does conduct electricity. So the technical characteristics of a semiconductor solar cell are chemically altered by the engineers in the lab by a process which is described as doping. So what happens during the doping process is that the engineers, they take a solar cell and they apply a certain chemical treatment to one side of the cell and then they apply a different kind of treatment, so a different kind of doping technique to the other side of the cell. And now you can imagine that as a result, since you are doing something different to each side of the solar cell, you're getting some kind of a boundary layer between the two sides of the cell. And this boundary layer is referred to as the PN junction of a solar cell. So it's called the PN junction because one side, as a result of the doping, is more positively charged, the P, and the other side is more negatively charged, and therefore the PN junction. But I think it's much easier to explain this with a simple diagram. So in this example, we start off with a specific type of semiconductor material, it's silicon. We take a piece of silicon and we place it like this in a diagram. And then we apply the doping, so the chemical treatment as discussed, whereby now the top of the cell and the bottom of the cell, they have different technical and chemical properties. In the next step, we apply some conductive material both on the top and the bottom, because we want to be able to wire this into a system, right? So now when we have this, we have created a proper semiconductor that's ready to be incorporated into a system. If we would now take this piece of semiconductor material and place it outside in the sun, then once the, the sun beams hit the semiconductor material, then at the very boundary layer, so on the PN junction between the two sides of the semiconductor, something starts to happen. Because electrons, which are the driving force behind the electricity, start to jump from one side of the semiconductor to the other side. If we would now place a wire between one side of the semiconductor and the other side, it would take some kind of an electrical appliance. In this case, it's a light bulb. We are able to power up the light bulb and we have produced electricity. So we went a little bit in depth, but at least you understand now properly what is the driving force behind your solar panel, which is the photovoltaic effect. And you understand what it means, semiconductor, PN junction, etc. So I think it's now time to look at the next topic. So which kind of materials can be used to actually create semiconductors and to build solar modules? All right, let him shut up for a second. I just want to explain to you that the content of this video is copied from the complete course of off-grid energy systems. 
If this information is enough for you, great. If you want to learn more and if you want to get access to the complete course, then check the information in the description below. All right, you go out again. So the first one is the thin film type of solar uh, material. And you've often come across this. You can find it, for example, in that small piece of um, solar panel that's placed into your old school kind of cal calculator. And this type of material can, can have a yield, can have a, a overall efficiency of just over 20%. Now, I think it's important that you understand what the efficiency of a solar panel refers to. So the efficiency is indicated as the total amount of electrical energy that you're getting out of your uh, solar panel compared to the amount of solar energy that hits your solar panel. So if your solar panel has an efficiency of 20%, then 20% of the sun power is turned into electricity and the other 80% is then turned into something else. So part of it can be reflected back into the atmosphere as light, but a large part of the sun power that hits your panel is actually turned into heat, into thermal energy. This makes sense because if you would, on a, on a bright sunny day, if you would feel your solar panel, it can become boiling hot. So a large part of the other 80% of the power of the sun just gets turned into direct heat. Now, besides the thin film material, there's also the crystalline material. And we'll look into the crystalline material a bit uh, later on in depth. But the crystalline will already give you a higher overall efficiency compared to the thin film. So crystalline will go just over 27% in overall efficiency. You can even get a higher overall efficiency if you're going for the gallium arsenide, which is pretty amazing because it can go over 30%. But gallium arsenide is normally only used for you know, special projects such as uh, race projects or for the, the solar planes, the solar boats or the, the solar cars, you know, they do in Australia. That's why they would use the gallium arsenide for. It's great material, but it's really expensive. And then if you want to go even better, you can go for the multi-junction type of solar cells and they can go up to 50% in overall efficiency, which is amazing, I think. But they are really, really expensive. So you would only typically see them in applications such as with satellites, where the higher price of the solar panel is warranted. So let's zoom in on the topic of crystalline materials, because this is the type of solar panel that you will most likely use for your setup. So there are two different kinds of crystalline material. The first one is the mono crystalline material, which goes up to 27% of overall efficiency. And the second one is the poly crystalline material, which goes up to 23% of efficiency. So most of the time it's pretty easy to distinguish between the two types just by looking at the solar panels, because the polycrystalline panels are often a bit brighter, a bit more bluish, and they have this very typical flaky kind of character. So you can actually see the different crystals in the solar panel itself. The monocrystalline panel doesn't have this kind of flaky appearance. Most of the times it's much darker and it's got this very even color throughout. And you can also recognize a monocrystalline panel by the typical rounded off or cut off corners of the individual solar cells. So I think that's enough you need to know about materials. At least you have a bit of an idea which kind of options there are. Now let's look at how you can take the individual solar cells and combine them so that you can actually form a solar photovoltaic module. So if we are creating a solar system and we're going from small to big, then we start with a solar cell. If we wire several solar cells together and place them into one frame, then we have created a solar module. If we now combine uh, two or more solar modules together into one rigid frame that comes pre-wired out of the factory, so from the supplier, then we have created a solar panel. And then if we combine several of these pre-wired solar panels together into one overall system, we have now created a solar array. But these are just words, so let me explain it a bit easier by giving you some visual materials or photos of what the four different steps actually look like. So let's have a look first at the solar cell. So what you can see here is a polycrystalline solar cell, like we discussed before. And I want to point out three different components of the cell. So we'll look at the fingers, the bus bars, and the connectors. So the first one, the fingers, are the very tiny, narrow strips of conductive material, which are attached on both sides of the solar cell. And then the fingers, they collect the power from the solar cell, redirect it through the, the bus bars, which are the, the larger kind of conductive material that are attached to the surface of the solar cell. And then, of course, you want to connect the solar cell to other solar cells. So at the end of the bus bars have the connectors where they are welded together with the other solar cells. 
So now you understand what a solar cell is. Now, if we combine all the solar cells together, then we are creating a solar module. This is probably something you, you easily recognize. And here you can identify the, the, the individual components, right? You have the solar cells, you have the bus bars connecting all the cells together. You've got the frame around it and the backing sheet. So this is a solar module. And if you would closely look at this photo, you'll be able to see that all the cells are kind of uh, connected all together in one long string, in one kind of a long snake, right? And the head and the tail of the snake, this is where the, the bus bars go through the panel and on the back side of the panel, that's where the two wires will be connected to. Now you can see the individual solar cells in this module. But there's something interesting in the way that they connect all the cells together. So if we zoom in a little bit more, you can see how they actually connect one cell to the other one. Because it seems like cell number one is just directly connected to cell number two through the main bus bar. But if you look more closely, you can see that actually the top of cell number one, the bus bar, is actually folded under cell number two and then connected, well you can't see it, but there it's connected to the bus bar at the bottom of cell number two. And then the current runs from the bottom of cell number two through the solar cell up to the top. And then again, the bus bar at the top of cell number two collects the electricity and just sends it through again to the bottom of cell number three. And it just continues like this throughout the whole solar module. Okay, we're going a little bit in detail here, but uh, I like to explain things and you're here to learn, right? So now you fully understand how the wiring runs throughout a solar module. Now let's have a look at the basic components from a module. So let's take a theoretical solar panel and just pull all the layers apart so I can name each and every layer individually. So this is not rocket science. You first have the frame, then you have the, the first the glass cover, you have the encapsulant, then you have the actual solar cells themselves with all the wiring there, then you have another encapsulant, the backing sheet, and on the, all the way on the back you've got the junction box which is normally glued on the backing sheet. Okay, so I think that's enough for solar modules. You fully understand now the different components, how they're wired together. Now let's briefly look at a slight variation of the solar module, which is the solar panel. So the proper definition of a solar panel is more than one photovoltaic module which are mounted together on one solid frame and they're already pre-wired by the manufacturer. So this is actually a solar panel. Uh, this being said, you know now the difference between a module and a panel, but most of the time people refer to both the modules and the panels with the word of photovoltaic panel or solar panel. So now that you understand the difference between a cell, a module and a panel, let's look at what a solar array actually is. So a solar array is a combination of several modules or panels that are all connected in series. So they're all connected head to toe with each other. And this a solar array is often referred to as a string, as one string of solar panels or modules. This is being done in order to increase the overall operating voltage of the system. So the typical voltage that you will see for one array is somewhere between 500 and 1500 volts direct current. All right, so now that you understand all of this, now let's look at the last section on connections. And I want to look specifically at junction boxes and the external connectors, so the wires that come out of solar panels. So junction boxes are those plastic black boxes that are glued to the back side of solar panel. So they're glued to the backing sheet of your solar module. And they basically have three functions. So the first one is to connect the external wiring uh, with the, the bus bars that come from all the solar cells in the front of the solar panel. The second function is that it contain the bypass diodes, and I'll explain later on what bypass diodes actually do for you. And the third function is that they, they're weatherproof, so they, they make sure that there's no connection between the internal uh, components that carry the electricity and the outside uh, environmental components. So bypass diodes are electrical components called diodes, which allow the current only to flow in one direction, and they provide a bypass, they provide a, a way around your solar panel if part of your panel is not functioning properly. So let me explain this as simple as I can with a simple wiring diagram of a typical solar panel. So by now you understand that all your cells of your solar panel, they're all connected in one long string. So they're all connected in series with each other. So a result of this is that 
if one of your cells wouldn't be working, if one of the connections between the solar cells would be faulty, or if part of your panel uh, would be shaded with whatever kind of uh, reason, then the whole panel wouldn't work anymore. And this is, of course, what you would like to, to avoid. So now the bypass diode comes to the rescue, because imagine that the first third of the solar panel is being malfunctioning. So either due to shade or due to something broken inside of the panel, then in order to avoid the whole panel to stop working, the bypass diode will provide an alternative path for the electricity to flow. So in this situation, the bypass diode will just cancel out the first third of the panel and will then still allow the other two thirds of the panel to perform. Now, it depends on the specific configuration of your panel, but most of the times you have two or three bypass diodes. So again, if the, the second part of the panel would be shaded, then another bypass diode would kick in and would still allow for another part of the panel to work. But the main message here is that if you wouldn't have any bypass diodes, if one cell would be malfunctioning due to shade or due to bad wiring or whatever, then the whole panel would stop functioning. If you have bypass diodes in place, then just part of the panel will be cut off, but the rest of the panel would still perform as usual. So we're going quite a bit in depth now, but now you understand really what the, the purpose is of the bypass diodes and how they help to um, increase the overall stability and performance of your solar system. Uh, we discussed the junction boxes, what they do. Now let's look at the very last topic and let's look at the external connectors, so the wires that come out of your solar panel. Now this topic is quite uncomplicated because the external connectors just have a single core and um, they're separated into male and female to make it uh, pretty idiot proof so you can't uh, place them in the wrong connector. Uh, one is positive, one is negative and most of the types of connectors you'll find on the market are that of the type of MC4 where the MC4 stands for multi-contact and the 4 is, uh, is 4 millimeters. And I want to just point out one specific thing is that the two clips on the MC4 C4, they make sure that whenever you connect a male to a female, uh, they cannot disconnect uh, by you just pulling on, on the wire. So you need a very specific tool in order to disconnect the wires. And this again increases the overall reliability of your system. So well done for staying with me so far. You understand quite a bit now. So we cover the connections. You understand the photovoltaic effect, what it does, what it means. We looked at the different kind of materials that can be used for to creating solar cells and solar modules. And we looked at how you can take a cell and then wire it in different ways in order to actually create an overall solar system. So well done. This concludes the topic on solar panels and I hope you enjoyed it.